Why a product? Because we sell experiences. And how you experience that product, it's what makes our profession unique. So as an entrepreneur, I find that the easiest way for me to mentalize this process is if I see it as a product that I happen to sell that creates an experience. Business of Architecture, episode 223. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. As a podcast listener, get free instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. In today's episode, I speak with a remarkable entrepreneur, educator, and architect. Ricardo Alvarez Diaz is the founding principal of Alvarez Diaz and Villalon, an award-winning architecture and interior design practice with offices in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and Miami, Florida. Alvarez Diaz is president of the Puerto Rico Builders Association. He serves as the founding co-chair of the local Urban Land Institute District Council, and he's also on the board of directors of Invest Puerto Rico, a nonprofit organization established in 2017 to promote the island's economic development. He teaches a course on entrepreneurship at the School of Architecture, Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico, and frequently writes on the topics of leadership, sustainability, with his wife and business partner, Cristina Villalon, he co-sponsors the Alvarez Diaz and Villalon Fund at the University of Notre Dame, of which he is a graduate. If you're looking for inspiration on running an impactful practice, you're absolutely going to love today's interview with Ricardo Alvarez Diaz. He holds nothing back as he shares the triumphs and challenges of growing his successful design firm in Puerto Rico. Now, I feel like I just gave my tongue an exercise trying to roll those R's properly. If you're a Spanish speaker, uh, I beg your forgiveness. I do have a lazy tongue. Although I do speak Spanish, I thought I'd give it the old college try. In today's episode, you'll discover how he transitioned from being an employee to running his own firm. You'll discover his formula for getting the right projects and clients, even in an economic downturn. You'll learn about the three I's that chart the path for growing your business. And around the 16-minute mark of this episode, Alvarez Diaz sums up four years of his business insights and growth in about 30 seconds. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, I'd love it if you leave a review on iTunes. This is a worldwide movement, and I would love your support for what we're doing here at the Business of Architecture, because ultimately, this is your movement. And by leaving a review on iTunes, you allow other architects to find this show and understand how they can grow their practices. They don't need to charge rock-bottom prices. They can deliver excellent design. If you don't have an iPhone, you can visit iTunes.com on your computer, sign up for an Apple account there, and you'll be able to leave a review. And of course, when you leave a review, I will give you a shout out here on the Business of Architecture podcast, and you'll be heard by the thousands of Business of Architecture faithful. So without further ado, here's my interview today with architect Ricardo Alvarez Diaz. Ricardo, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm thankful that uh, I was able to take uh, a little bit of time uh, to spend uh, with you uh, with a nice change of pace. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm calling you from Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico has been hit with a couple of hurricanes. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm happy and excited to be talking to you. Good. Yeah, we can talk for once about something besides the hurricanes, right? Excellent. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, literally looking forward to this. Good. Well, you definitely have a passion with architecture and entrepreneurship. First of all, I'd like to talk about your firm itself, kind of your journey as an entrepreneur. Right before this, uh, we went live here. You and I were just discussing uh, entrepreneurship and going out on our own and the importance of freedom. And I kind of said, well, I, I discovered that I was a good employee for about three years. And after that, I would get restless. And you said your limit was about two years. That is true. It, it is about two years. I, I, uh, when I finished college, I went to work in New York City uh, for uh, a firm, and I, I, I was there for a little bit over two years. And then I came back to Puerto Rico, and I work, uh, worked for a local firm for uh, maybe two years, too. 
And then that's when I decided to go on my own. So yes, uh, the two year mark uh, worked for me. <laughs> and so from the start, you did you start out in New York City when you started your firm or were you in Puerto Rico when you did no. that? I was in Puerto Rico. I'm, when I finished college, I went to work for uh, Robert Stern in New York, uh, Robert A. M. Stern in New York. And, um, and after that, uh, I, I, I loved the work, but I understood that I wanted to come home because I wanted to make a mark in, in where I was from. Uh, I, I, uh, my father was born in Cuba. My mom was born in Dominican Republic and I was born in Puerto Rico. And I, was, and I felt, I think it was important for me to return uh, because after uh, going to school, I went to school at Notre Dame and, and, and living in New York City for a while, I, I felt I had the responsibility of actually taking what I've learned and hopefully going back to where I was from and uh, teaching a little bit and learning from, you know, my, my, my culture. So that's why I decided to come back. And I worked uh, for a little bit over two years for a local firm. And I was lucky enough to uh, find a person who uh, thought that I could design something okay and basically hired me. Uh, and that's when I decided to go on my own. So I was one of the lucky people. And that was in 2001. So it, now it's been a little bit over 16 years. Yeah, 2001. So you start out with one project. After that, how did you find work? Well, you know, it, it's, it, it's a great question because, it, it, and I'm sure you have the same experience. When you go to school, you're taught that for some reason, uh, you, the, the only thing you focus in is basically design. So you don't, no one teach you, teaches you the tools to, to become an entrepreneur. Uh, so I'm assuming that when I came out of college, like everyone else, you, ask, you, you come out and you expect that people are going to call you because you're supposedly so talented that they will call you uh, and they will basically say, hey, please, please, Mr. Architect, do my building, do my house because you're so good. We know that that's not the reality. Uh, so in my case, I got lucky because I was, I knew a, a friend of my parents who was looking to do some work. And the first thing I did is actually try to bring that client to the office I was working at. And the uh, firm I was working said, no, that might not be the right client for us. So at that moment, that's when I decided, well, it might not be the right client for that firm, but it definitely is the right client for me. So that's what pushed me to actually going on my own. So I was able to go on my own with one project. Uh, again, I, at that time, I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. I was 27 years old and I had nothing to lose. So it was a lot easier to do it then than, of course, when you have a lot of responsibility. So from there, it, it was basically word of mouth. You know, uh, this guy uh, referred me to other clients. Uh, and, you know, and that's basically how it worked. But again, you have to remember, Enoch, that that was 2001. At that time, you didn't have to do much and work would come to you. Uh, it wasn't on, I would say that it wasn't until 2008 when the crash hit, when all work stopped completely. And I was reminded of the fact that I had no, none of the tools to actually get work. Because for seven years, I didn't really have to get out there. Uh, it would kind of come to me. And I always assumed that that's, what, that, that's the way it should have been. Because I'm so famous and so good that people would come up to me. And that's not how it works. So um, in 2008, 2009, I, I stopped completely. And I, and I, and I re really did some uh, deep soul searching. And number one, trying to find out if I really wanted to be an architect. And number two... And by the way, that first part came out of fear, the fear of not knowing what to do and not having the tools to actually do, do, do be an entrepreneur and actually get work. And then the second was, OK, if I'm going to be an architect, what kind of architect I want to be? Because uh, I never really had a chance to sit and analyze that because I went to a to a great firm and then I went to I came back to Puerto Rico and then I started working and I never took any time to analyze what kind of work and what kind of professional I wanted to be. It, I became a prostitute. Basically, I would say yes to anything. Oh, do you do, do you do hotels? Sure. Uh, do you do houses? Yes. But I never stopped to analyze if that's actually the kind of work I really wanted to do. So, um, uh, you know, you're qu going back to your question, how did I get work originally? I got work because the time was ripe to uh, actually, you know, get work in the traditional way. But after 2008, you know, it was completely different.
Tell me about your process of then using those entrepreneurial skills and then learning about the active measures to actually bring work so that even if a recession comes, you still have skill set to be able to go out there and drum up some work. Well, um, just to give you some uh, perspective, in Puerto Rico, the recession did not begin in 2008. It actually began in 2006. Uh, just, but because we opened the office so early in 2001, we were a little bit over the tipping point. So uh, when 2006 happened, we weren't as much affected. But of course, when 2008 happened, we were very much affected. So like I said, um, well, at that moment, we stopped and, and, and I stopped. And, and when I did some soul searching, I, um, instead of going the traditional route of, of uh, getting uh, and sitting with other architects and actually finding mentorship from architects, I, I was, um, I did, I actually sat down with lawyers. I sat down with uh, accountants and people who provided services. Uh, and I sat down with a person that I respect quite a bit. He, he used to own, uh, you know, be one of the owners of one of the banks in Puerto Rico. And I, um, uh, I really wanted to understand how I can sell a product instead of actually how can I be a, an architect? Um, and going through that process, uh, I, I took a little bit about, you know, from different people I've, I've talked to, uh, like I said, lawyers, uh, accountants, I looked at the business model that, um, PR companies use, uh, uh, because they have it interesting. I have to say PR companies are interesting because they have the creative side on one side and then they have the business side on the other side. And I find it immensely uh, uh, curious that for some, for some reason, architects are forced to do both. You have to be creative, but you also have to be a good business person. And as you and I know, sometimes those two things don't necessarily match. So I, I found that that model was, was a little interesting. I mean, you have the people who are in charge of the business, and then you have people who are actually in charge of the creative side. Uh, and we, we did what I call a little bit of a melting pot of ideas. Um, and we, we sat down, and, and, and I came up with the, what I call the three eyes. Um, Introspection, instruction, and implementation. Introspection is basically analyzing uh, uh, who you are, why do you do what you do, how do you do it, what do you do. Um, try to identify and develop a vision for yourself and for your company. Uh, develop a mission, a very clear mission. And then after you go through a whole process of analyzing who you are, who you want to become, what level of uh, aspiration do you want to achieve, then you move to instruction. Because what happens is that if we only focus on the traditional ways that architects have done their businesses, you and I know that the model is very simple. You become a teacher, a professor, uh, you, are, you do design, uh, you get published, and then money comes from heaven because you are obviously so talented that they'll knock on your door. And you and I know that's not how it works. So, and then you move to the part that is instruction and you need to instruct yourself. I, had the, I didn't have the benefit of, of working too long for a company that allowed me to have mentors in architecture. So uh, in a way, I went on my own too young, which at the time sounded great, but a little bit after, afterwards, you reached a limit and then you can't break that ceiling because you don't, you don't know anything. I didn't go to business school. So... Uh, if, you if you identify mentors, even if they're outside of your, of your realm, uh, and they can help you in the part of instruction, learning about you know, edu educate, uh, educating yourself, learning about leadership, learning about uh, the difference between a mature business and an adolescent business, learning about what is really a business plan. And then last but not least, implementation. After you do all that, we went through a process of, okay, now we know who we are, we know who we want to, who our client, ideal clients are, and now we have to just act and do the part of implementation with branding, marketing, networking, obviously social media, and, and understanding the importance also of public speaking. So I would say in a, in a, very, in a nutshell, um, I, I explained four years of, a, <laughs> of, of, a, a, of all the work we had to go through uh, and, and really see ourselves instead of a, as, a, as an architect, but more as a service provider uh, that actually has a purpose, that, that ha a service provider that ha happens to have a purpose. So. 
And I know that you do currently, you do currently teach at a college there in Puerto Rico. Uh, do you primarily see yourself as an educator, an architect, an entrepreneur? How do you, how do you feel that you fit? Um, I, I, I see myself as an entrepreneur. Um, uh, now I could, I definitely could tell you that eight years ago, there's no way I saw myself that way. Um, no, I see myself as an entrepreneur and, and my calling is to make sure that, um, the same experiences that I went through in, two, in 2008, when I actually even questioned my, the decision of actually of, of my profession, I want to make sure that the people who are, uh, you know, learning architecture, that they have enough information in their, in their plate. So they, they don't have to go through the same process. Many of us, and I'm sure you went through the same process yourself. Uh, uh, because I'm sure that when you went when you went to school, you didn't see yourself as an entrepreneur. You saw yourself as a designer because that's how you see yourself. Um, so I see myself now more as an entrepreneur, uh, who happens to be an architect, uh, and who happens to be an, an, an educator. Now you talked about wanting to not not sell services. You talked about wanting to sell your architectural um, a, as a product. Yeah. Right. I remember you mentioning that. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, I, I find that a, a, you know, product is, um, is a little bit more than just selling a service. And part of the reason that, yes, I did mention that we are in the business of actually, you know, servicing people. Um, the product, you, the, there's something you sell, and that sell is an actual product. And if you see yourself that way, it, it actually allows you to come out of the, uh, your comfort zone and analyze your business in a, from, a, from a different point of view than what normally you, you know, architects uh, do it, which is basically focused on, on design itself. Why a product? Uh, because we sell experiences. Um, uh, and, and how you experience that product is um, it's what makes our profession unique. So as an entrepreneur, I find that the easiest way for me to mentalize this process is if I see it as a product that I happen to sell that creates an experience. Because at the end of the day, you and I know that architects are not like artists because architects cannot be selfish because they don't design for themselves. They design for someone else. And it requires a great deal of self-awareness to be able to provide a product and experience that is aligned with someone else's vision instead of your own. And I, and I want to be clear about that because I, I, don't want, I don't want anyone to misunderstand that we don't have a vision as a company and we don't have a mission. Absolutely. But we're here, here to enable someone else's vision and make it a reality if we impose our own visions when it comes to design to a client we'll, we're being selfish because we're imposing something that that person might not necessarily need so it, it's it's a little different that again be an artist because an artist I, you can be selfish and be an artist you can do whatever you think is right um but having a having a, the ability to become basically a, an enabler for someone else's you know, vision, is, it, it's a great responsibility. And I, and I find that to be um, a, an, an outstanding opportunity as a professional, that you're able to provide a service, provide an experience, enable someone to achieve that vision, make the, that person, you know, have a unique experience and at the same time getting paid for it that's amazing i have to say i have to tell you that's pretty good i have no <laughs> no uh, you know quarrels with that so you talked about your three eyes which i love the introspection instruction implementation and you said that that was a point in 2008 you've kind of coalesced this theory uh, uh that's practical for you how have you applied that in your own business and in your own life tell me about this process what did you learn what have you come up through the introspection that your firm represents? Well, the first thing is that um, it, when, when you go through a process of why, uh, which is the first thing you have to ask yourself, you know, um, 
anyone could do what we do. What do you do? Well, I'm an architect, okay? How do you do it? I design. But if you ask yourself, why do you do it? It's a lot different. It's a, it's a, it's a deeper understanding that goes beyond only the um, mechanical part of the business. So I, I, um, I took some time actually analyzing why do I do what I do? Uh, and our answer uh, to, uh, you know, to that question is um, because we want to create places of purpose. That is it. That is our vision as a company, creating places of purpose. Um, and as soon as we're able to cl clarify uh, our vision, you know, our mission just came uh, uh, naturally. Our mission is actually to, to um, uh, enable uh, that, that, that vision itself. So once we had that clear, the next step was basically, okay, so um, why do we want to do what we do? Well, you know, I, do I think that architecture needs leaders? Yes, I absolutely do. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure you've heard this, but in the last two, over 230 uh, years that we've had Congress, we've only had two architects in Congress, one who was licensed and the other one you know, which uh, happened to be president, um, Thomas Jefferson. And, you know, uh, in that same span, we've had 10 undertakers. So I honestly wonder, what is our position as architects in, in the profession? Because we claim that we're here to, uh, to lead, and, and, and help people make decisions, but we have not inserted ourselves in, uh, in leadership positions outside of our own realm. So when we went through our why in the company, uh, and of course our, our why we, what we do and how we do it, that, that thing about leadership came uh, quite, um, it, it came strong to us when we were in the process of instructing ourselves of what, 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 what exactly we wanted to do. Um, and we felt that we had a, a, an obligation as a professional, as an entrepreneur in architecture, to get outside of our comfort zone and actually um, be involved in many different uh, opportunities outside of architecture. Uh, and the reason I, I'll come back to why I, I, I'm talking about leadership, because when we were analyzing successful case studies of companies outside of architecture, we realized that they always had a very strong leader, a strong leader not only within the community, but also outside of the realm of those companies. Um, and I felt that we had a responsibility to put ourselves outside of what makes us comfortable. Um, and that was, a, that was actually a very important moment for me personally in 2010. Um, and then of course we developed a very clear business plan of how we wanted to do it. Um, Basically, a business plan, I'll give you an idea. We identify what kind of clients we ideally wanted. Instead of waiting for clients to come and tell us, hey, do you do hotels? We analyzed our, uh, 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 deeply and said, okay, what kind of projects we want to do? Is it hotels? Sure. Is it affordable housing? Sure. Okay. If we have that clear and we're absolutely clear about the kind of projects we want to make, Let's now be you know, surgical and try to identify the right client for us instead of the other way around. Um, and actually, going back to the, the, the leadership part, it was very useful because when, you, when we put ourselves in a position of leadership in different areas, it allowed us to meet a lot of people outside of architecture. Um, and again, it allowed us to meet many leaders that, net, uh, you know, they, that needed um, our services. Um, and of course, if you know exactly what kind of services you want to provide, you want to put yourself in that position around people that you know that they're the decision makers for that. And of course, the implementation is, uh, we, we could talk, uh, talk about it in detail, but um, it, it's a lot more specific because once you know who you are and what kind of firm you want to become, and, and now that you've gone through this whole process of learning, about uh, your, your, who you want to become and, how you, and you, how you can do it. Well, the implementation was, um, was challenging because it, it became, um, in a way, we implemented some of the ideas we assumed worked, but I can tell you a couple of examples of what did not work. Um, I'll give you an example. Yeah, we, felt, it, it, uh, it, we felt that retail was 
the best way for us to go international because you could do a lot more in a lot less time uh, and retail work could be built within two to three months and then you would have a lot of portfolio. So ideally you assumed, oh, if we only focus on retail outside of, uh, you know, or, or the, outside of the Caribbean, we will be able to actually have a lot more work, a lot more portfolio, and we can move faster. We did that for three years and we were very successful when it comes to the quality of work we were able to do from uh, stores as large as Nordstrom to uh, a, a 25 a stores that we were hired to do in, in the Middle East. In, uh, and the first one was building Oman and the second one in uh, Abu Dhabi. And, you know, the, the plan was perfect. My God, we're getting work internationally. We're, we've been published. We're now ranked as a t- one of the top 40 retail firms in the U.S. But guess what? In 2015, we sat down and we analyzed and we realized that we had all that, but we still were not making money. So, yeah, all that introspection and all that instruction, awesome. (laughs) But the reality made us realize that, wait, 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 we're spending all this energy. We've grown with with the amount of uh, team members that we have. But we're still not making, we're breaking even. How is it possible that we went from 20 projects to 57 projects a year and we're still not making money? Is it because we're being inefficient? Is it because we're not doing it right? Is it because we're learning on the job? What is it? Um, And we basically realized that the amount of energy you have to put in to design a new store from scratch uh, is enormous. And unless you repeat it, 20 times the same design across the US, you don't make any money. So if you focus only on doing one or two, you're not gonna make money. So that's one example of what we realized that, oh, we have to stop and and let's focus that instead of doing 57 projects a year, let's do 20. Let's go back for 20 of the projects that we feel we are gonna um, be uh, surgical and try to look for. And that's when we shifted back to, a, a, a entertainment and uh, hospitality and, and affordable housing. And I could tell you that the difference between two, 2015 and 2016 was incredible. We went from a uh, breaking even to actually literally, thankfully, making money. And that was in 2016. So, you know, this is a learning process. Uh, uh, you, could, you could have all the perfect, uh, you know, bullets that you can have, but it's a trial and error and you will learn. The key is to actually pick up on it quick enough and having, and having the, um, I would say, and, and not be afraid of saying no to a client. And I think that's uh, one of the things that I can tell you that it took me 14 years in my business to realize that I actually can say no to a client. And I actually can or should say no and help and direct that client to maybe to another architect that's better suited for that project than yourself. Um, and that requires you know, maturity in your own um, and confidence uh, and, not being a, and not allowing fear to actually take over your decision. I can tell, uh, decisions. I could tell, I could tell you, Anok, that most of the mistakes that I've done in the last 16 years, if not all of them, are decisions that I made out of fear. I'll give you an example. If I don't, and I'm sure this happens to every one of the listeners that, 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 that you have. If I don't say yes to this client, I know this is not the right client. I know I don't want to do this project, but if I don't say yes, I don't know if I'm going to have work four months from now. I can tell every single one that it's better to say no than say yes to a, a, a project that you know is toxic from the beginning, either because the client is toxic, either because you think that you're not gonna necessarily make money. Uh, you have to make that decision and you can say no, of course, without arrogance, very simply. Listen, I don't think we're the right firm for you, um, but I would love to help you. I'm gonna identify the right you know, professional for you and you can actually, you know, paid forward, match the right architect with the right client. Not every single client is the right client for you. And, and the same thing happens with a client. Not every architect is the right architect for them. So saying no was, uh, 
was a big turning point. And actually, sadly, I have to tell you that saying no, you know, we started doing that only two and a half years ago. So after 16 years. So uh, I wish I could tell anyone, oh, yes, from the beginning we knew, of course not. There's no way. I mean, it's, it's a learning process. And, 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 and again, it requires self-awareness, forcing yourself to be humble and understanding yourself enough so you could actually say no respectfully and allow your business to actually grow. So when you look back across your career and you see these pivot points of these times when you, you had one way of approaching something and you were quickly able to recognize and go a different direction, when you look back, what are some of the other big, maybe false assumptions, false mm. beliefs that you had about the way the business worked that were kind of big ahas that you can share with us? Well, I think that the big aha was assuming that just because you get published, you're going to get work the day after. No, that, that's uh, getting published, in my experience, is all about giving validation to your work. And it, it, and it helps you when you brand yourself because it always validates that you've been published in a national uh, you know, publication. But being published does not get you work. That's uh, an aha moment that every single person should know. Um, Second thing, just because you, um, you work at an educational level and you are around a lot of architects, that doesn't mean that, again, you're going to be a successful entrepreneur. You might be a successful educator. You might be an absolute uh, excellent designer. But again, and it might even give you some level of exposure, which is always needed. But if you do not have a plan, a clear path and a plan for who you want to be and what you want to be or what kind of business you want to have, you might get one great project and then you might not get another one because it has to be sustainable. Um, the, other thing, the other aha moment I, um, I, I can tell you about is... Um, if you tell a client uh, that, if, uh, let me put it like this. If, if a client tells you, uh, I, I want this project uh, to be done X, Y, and Z, and you don't take seriously um, the ramifications of uh, the license that you have as an architect, uh, you, you're an amateur in the business. I'm going to give you an example. If a client comes up to you and says, hey, I, um, I want uh, to do a terrace for my house. Excellent. Yeah, but, you know, I want it done quickly. I, I know what I want. It doesn't comply with the legal, uh, you know, zoning uh, restraints, but let's just do it anyway. And, and you as an architect go, okay, fine, let's do, just do it. No, you need to educate your client. You need to tell them how it works. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be your, um, your responsibility. Uh, so another, I, I could tell you that there's so many aha moments, so I don't want to take too much of your time, no, but, um, them. go for it. Uh, I'll give you a, a couple more. Um, if you see yourself as a, as an architect and you see moonlighting jobs as a way of, uh, of making money to spend money, you're not really taking yourself seriously as a professional because you, as a, there's a big difference between, between being a good designer I'm being a good architect. They're totally different things. If you look away uh, to a code offering, like I said, you, you're basically not, 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 not taking yourself very seriously. Um, if you run a studio instead of a business and you keep seeing yourself as a, as a, as a studio instead of a business, you're not really going to go over the hump to become a mature professional. So I... I don't consider myself a, that we have a, a business, a studio. We do have a business. So you become mature if you have a long-term plan, uh, if you're unflinching and decisive, and you don't see things in a, as a gray area, you, you obviously are more, much more mature. Um, uh, and I, one last I have moment I want to tell you, which is, it sounds a little trivial. When you actually have office hours, and when you have and you're clear about the fact that you have office hours, 
uh, that is a big deal. That's when you've actually g- gone through the uh, hump. Uh, because if you keep thinking that you have to work 15, 20 hours a day, like we did in college, you're not really uh, understanding your profession as a business. Uh, you are actually a very bad uh, manager, in my, my point. Uh, so, um, but I, I, uh, I'm going to have to t- uh, give credit to my wife. Uh, my wife is uh, my partner in, in this business. And we have another partner uh, in, the, uh, in our business. Um, and my wife said, said to me, when I had this issue of becoming, um, if I wanted to be an architect or not, she said, well, do you have a purpose? So if you ask yourself, if you have no purpose in what, in the decisions you're making in your business, you really uh, uh, have not done your, um, your homework. You have to look within. You have to make sure you understand your purpose. And that works for every single business. And I can tell you that the same um, business uh, uh, learnings that, we, that I can tell you about, and the, I'm sure the ones that you, in your own business, Enoch, and, and the ones that you preach, work not only for architecture businesses, they work for also every single other business uh, that, that, you, um, that, that you want to develop. So, so uh, there, there's, a, there's, several, uh, uh, there's a bunch of aha moments that I've had, but learning how to say no, not being afraid of saying no, making sure that, um, that you run a business and not a studio, I, I, I hate to say those again, but they're, uh, they're, they, they were important in my process. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.